Thank you. Our next item of business is con point of order, Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. I wish to raise a point of order in relation to Chapter 13 of the Standing Orders, including Rule 13.2. Last week, the Scottish Government announced that it had approved proposals to close the children's ward at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. Many local families are devastated by this decision, and it is only right that it receives the fullest possible parliamentary scrutiny. There will be a ministerial statement shortly on the closure, but the Scottish Government should have given families, parents and NHS staff the courtesy of a statement as soon as the Cabinet Secretary was in a position to make an announcement. Instead, the closure was announced in an answer to a Government-inspired written question lodged on Thursday when Parliament was sitting, with an answer snuck out at 2.03pm on a Friday afternoon when it was not, and when the Government was advising people to leave work early due to adverse weather conditions. Instead of trying to bury bad news, the Government could and should have given prior notice to families and staff that a decision of such importance was imminent and would be announced directly to Parliament. President Officer, can I ask that you consider whether the use of Government-inspired question was appropriate in this case and that their use by the Government to make such announcements is reviewed? Can you also confirm that no request by the Minister for a statement was made to you on Thursday under Rule 13.2? This decision should have been announced to this Parliament in this Parliament. And surely the way the Scottish Government has chosen to announce this closure is both discourteous to members, but more importantly, deeply disrespectful to those who depend on the kids' ward at the RAH. Can I thank the member, first of all, for the advance notice of the point of order. Uh, and as the member will be aware, the guidance on announcements sets out good practice which should be followed by the Scottish Government when informing the Parliament. It is intended to help the Scottish Government to decide which method is appropriate to make an announcement. I raised the member's concerns about this particular issue at today's Bureau meeting. We had a useful discussion about decisions more generally on which method to use to make an announcement. The Bureau has made its views known and this will help to inform future decisions by the Government. In this case, the Bureau has agreed to schedule a ministerial statement on this issue this afternoon following topical questions. This will allow members to question the, the Cabinet Secretary on the decisions made. And can I now invite uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, if I may, so yes, I invite Joe Fitzpatrick, if I may, to move um, the business motion on behalf of the Bureau. Thank you very much. Does anybody object to the motion? No. In that case, um, uh, the question is that we agree motion 10053. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We turn now to topical questions. Thank you. Question number one, Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to ensure everyone in police custody can exercise their right to legal advice from 25th of January 2018. Thank you. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I would refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest, wherein they will find that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland, that I hold a practising certificate, <laughs> albeit that I am not currently practising. Presiding Officer, <clears throat> part one of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 introduces increased rights of access to legal advice for people being held in police custody. These provisions followed recommendations within Lord Carloway's review of Scottish criminal law and practice and wide public consultation. The bill was passed unanimously by Parliament in December 2015. Since then, there has been extensive engagement with legal professionals through the Law Society of Scotland and local representative groups. Regulations to ensure a significantly enhanced package of legal aid uh, funding is available for private solicitors providing police station advice under the new arrangements and these were approved by the Scottish Parliament last month. The regulations introduce a new block fee system, a simplified process for claiming for police station advice and are an increase on existing rates. Police station advice is provided through a combination of solicitors in private practice who opt to be part of the police station duty scheme and solicitors employed directly by SLAB, Scottish Legal Aid Board. Where private solicitors have chosen to not participate in the current or the new scheme, SLAB has confirmed that it will handle requests for police station advice through the uh, 599 private solicitors who remain on the duty scheme and its own employed solicitors on the solicitor contact line and the public defence solicitor's office. This will ensure that appropriate access to legal advice is available for those in police custody from 25th January. 
Lee MacArthur. Right, can I thank the Minister for that uh, detailed response? These are indeed big changes for the police and those tasked with ensuring everyone has the legal advice they need at every stage of the justice process. Given recent developments and the serious concerns expressed from the borders to Moray and beyond, what assessment has the Scottish Government undertaken of how many people are expected to be working on the provision of legal advice for those in police custody on day one of the new scheme the day after tomorrow? And how does she respond to the suggestion by DCC Livingston at uh, Justice Committee this morning that some people may have to be moved between police stations to facilitate access to a solicitor? Minister. Uh, yes, so I would say that there has, of course, been contingency planning in place for some uh, considerable uh, time, uh, as informed by the Scottish Legal Aid Board, in terms of the uh, a range of arrangements that had to be put in place to implement Part 1 of the 2016 Act. Uh, uh, in addition to the 599 private uh, solicitors available for the on-call duty scheme that I referred to in my first answer, there are currently 13 uh, solicitor contact line solicitors working a shift pattern and 24 PDSO solicitors. Uh, all matters are currently uh, uh, and will continue to be as would be expected under uh, close monitoring to ensure that we have all necessary arrangements uh, in place. In response to the uh, question that the member raised about uh, 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 DCC uh, designate Ian Livingston at his evidence session this morning before the Justice Committee. Uh, uh, we are confident in general that access to legal advice will be available in whatever location someone is held in police custody without any need for them to be moved. As part of sensible contingency planning, if there were particular circumstances where it was absolutely necessary, as is the case under the current arrangements, it is possible to move someone held in custody to ensure access to legal advice. However, as I say, uh, we do not expect this to be required as part of the normal duty arrangements. Lee MacArthur. Thank you, and I thank the, the Minister. Ian Moyer of the Law Society this week said that falling pay rates and the difficulty of balancing on-call work with family life was leading to a significant fall in those willing to take on legal aid work. The review of legal aid announced last February was uh, expected to take a year. It was established to engage with the legal profession and come up with, quote, specific measures to reform Scotland's system of legal aid, maintaining access to public funding for legal advice and representation. Can the Minister tell Parliament when she expects that review to report? Minister. Uh, yes, I would just clarify, of course, that the, polit uh, the police station duty scheme is entirely voluntary uh, and no solicitor needs to participate in it. Even those who do sign up for it are not required to make themselves available 100% of the time. Uh, and, of course, we have also extended the definition of the antisocial hours premium and we have extended that not simply to telephone calls but also to travel, which was not a matter requested by the Law Society of Scotland in my negotiations uh, with them. Finally, in terms of the uh, legal aid review, we expect that to report uh, next month. And Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. Can the minister confirm discussions have been held with the Scottish Legal Aid Board and if they keep, feel comfortable with the changes being made to the prov provision of legal aid? Minister. Uh, officials have been closely engaged with the Scottish Legal Aid Board about the delivery of the Act provisions and SLAB has engaged directly with the profession on both the implications of the new rights and the capacity of the profession to deliver. The operational capacity to deliver is being continuously assessed as is normal practice for the current arrangements and SLAB is comfortable with the changes being made and the ability to deliver on those new rights. And Gordon Lindhurst. <clears throat> uh, follow the Minister's comments about the, the intricacies of this, but I think the Law Society has said that for the extension of the right of a solicitor present to work and practice, legal aid rates will require to increase significantly for this additional work. Um, in light of that, does the Minister agree that this adds to the case for legal aid reform, and indeed that the timing of this being implemented now before the report uh, that um, my colleague referred to uh, is, is unfortunate at the, the very least. Minister. Uh, just to respond to, to the points raised, uh, firstly, um, the, the part one of the, uh, the legislation that I referred to, the 2016 Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, is due to be in force on, this, by this, on Thursday of this week, and therefore, obviously, uh, would have been irresponsible of us not to have had in place legal aid arrangements reflecting uh, uh, the new uh, uh, arrangements. Um, as I say, uh, as I said in my response to Lee MacArthur, the legal aid review is expected to report uh, uh, next month, and it would perhaps just be important to, uh, for the record, presiding officer, to, to state that, of course, we did listen to the Law Society of Scotland's negotiating team, and we did increase the block fee rate, uh, and we did uh, increase the definition, extend the definition of anti-social hours premium. 
Uh, and we did uh, extend that not just to telephone calls but to travel, which was not even requested in the discussions with the Law Society. And we did increase our offer. We believe our offer uh, was a good one. Uh, and uh, we see, of course, that many, many private solicitors have decided to remain in the police duty scheme. Question number two, Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Oxfam report reward work, not wealth, and what action it's taken to tackle inequality. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding Officer, I welcome the Oxfam report reward work, not wealth, which makes a range of recommendations to governments and international institutions. We are committed to working to reduce inequality and protecting human rights within the limit and range of our powers. We've already set concrete time-bound targets to reduce inequality through the Child Poverty Scotland Act and will publish our first delivery plan by April 2018. In this year's draft budget, we set out proposals for a progressive income tax policy allocated £179 million in 2018-9 through the Attainment Scotland Fund and increased funding for the NHS. Beyond this, we are taking a wide range of actions to tackle poverty and inequality, including almost doubling the provision of free childcare by 2020, delivering at least 50,000 affordable homes uh, over this parliamentary term, and enacting the Fairer Scotland duty from April 2018, ensuring public bodies take due account of poverty and disadvantage whenever key decisions are made. Julian Martin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The report highlights growing global disparity between the richest and poorest in society, with 82% of all the world's wealth created in the last year going to the top 1% and nothing going to the bottom 50%. Oxfam calls on governments to create more equal societies, aiding ordinary workers and smaller businesses. Can the Scottish Government set out how, with the limited powers it has, it's moving Scotland towards a more egalitarian and fairer society? And does the Cabinet Secretary agree that Scotland could be seen as an example to other countries around the world to follow? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so I think the uh, important point about leading by example was reflected uh, in the comments uh, made by Dr Catherine Trebek, uh, Oxfam's uh, senior researcher uh, who's based in Glasgow, uh, when she said our ideas can be big and can resonate uh, beyond our, our, our borders. Uh, for this government, uh, tackling uh, inequality is not some uh, optional extra, it's part and parcel uh, of everything that we do. So, you know, in addition to the actions that I outlined in my original uh, response uh, in and around the implementation of how we're taking forward our duties under uh, the new Child Poverty Act. Uh, we're obviously taking very clear action to close the uh, wealth gap associated uh, with gender uh, segregation rules. Uh, we are working uh, very hard to uh, support uh, carers. Uh, there's our investment in affordable uh, housing uh, as well as uh, our labour market strategy and the work that we do across the government uh, to support inclusive of growth in our economy. And Julian Martin. Thank you once again for that answer, Mr. Cabinet Secretary. Once you could expand, the key finding of the report is that women are in the worst work and almost all the super rich are men. In a year that saw billionaires um, have fortunes grow by seven, $762 billion, women provided $10 trillion to the economy in terms of unpaid care throughout the world. And while we might not be able to solve this global problem ourselves, can the Scottish Government set out how it's leading the way in closing the wealth gap associated with gender segregated roles in Scotland and ensuring that caring is valued? Cabinet Secretary. So, uh, President Officer, there's a number of actions that this government uh, is indeed uh, taking forward. Uh, we are big supporters of Family Friendly uh, Working Scotland Partnership. It's a partnership between working uh, families, which is a leading UK work-life balance organisation, uh, parenting across Scotland and the Fathers Network. And that's uh, the reason detriment of that work is to support and promote uh, the development of family-friendly family <coughs> uh, workplaces, which will indeed uh, have a big impact on women, although not um, exclusively women. It's important uh, for fathers uh, and parents too. Uh, fair pay is also at the heart of our planned expansion uh, of the early years in childcare, uh, and we will enable pay of the living wage to all childcare staff uh, delivering the, the funded uh, entitlement by 2020. Uh, there's other work that we're doing to um, 
support uh, carers and uh, unpaid carers in terms of enabling them uh, to be better supported to look after their own, own uh, health and well-being, as well as the Care of Positive scheme, uh, which is about uh, supporting employers uh, to support uh, their employees who also have uh, caring responsibilities. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. As Oxfam highlighted this week, the wealth gap is widening, including in Scotland, and meanwhile this government has cut funding to lifeline public services. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that Dr Catherine Trebek of Oxfam said yesterday that the strain of yawning inequality is also being felt in Scotland and that this isn't a faraway crisis, it's grimly apparent that the inequality crisis is out of control? When will the Cabinet Secretary take the necessary steps to address this crisis here in Scotland, including asking the richest in our society to pay their fair share and, lift, and shift the balance of economic wealth to the many rather than the few? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. It is important to recognise that the report uh, focuses on worldwide inequality uh, and makes a number of recommendations to governments and international uh, institutions. The actual report, uh, in terms of my reading, didn't make any specific uh, mention of Scotland. Nonetheless, we uh, welcome the report. It's fair to reflect that uh, the recommendations would cut across uh, both devolved and uh, reserved power. It's also important to, to recognise that 60% of Scotland's uh, spending power uh, is still dependent uh, on Westminster decisions. Uh, nonetheless, we are absolutely determined uh, to utilise uh, all the powers and opportunities uh, available to us uh, within this government to address uh, poverty and inequality in this country. Uh, that isn't just the right thing to do, it's absolutely uh, the smart thing to do. Uh, it's reflected uh, in our aspirations around uh, inclusive growth, uh, our labour market strategy, our fair work commitments and it's also reflected in the work that we'll take forward uh, to uh, end child poverty uh, given that we know children are poor uh, because of the lack of income uh, in their families uh, or their household and that indeed will mean that we will have to uh, use all the powers at our disposal to tackle uh, structural inequality uh, that exists in Scotland and of course we look forward uh, to the advice from the new independent poverty and inequality commission. Question number three, Polly McNeill. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the number of disabled people on housing waiting lists. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government wants disabled people in Scotland to have access to homes that enable them to participate as full and equal citizens. Our disability delivery plan sets out a number of housing-related commitments that support this ambition. That includes the requirement for each local authority to include a realistic target for the delivery of wheelchair accessible housing as part of its local housing strategy and to report annually on their progress. We're also working with health and social care partnerships, disability organisations and the housing sector to ensure those in need of ad adaptations to their home can access those services. Polly McNeill. Presiding officer, an investigation by the Independent has revealed figures obtained from councils indicating that almost 10,000 disabled people are on waiting lists, but many of those people are stuck in unsuitable council houses and some still on waiting lists requesting a move five years on and much greater numbers than that. Does the, does the minister agree that it is intolerable for any person to be trapped in their home that does not suit their needs? And does the Minister not agree it's time to take more dramatic action to serve those people who need a move to a more suitable accommodation? Have a second. Minister, sir. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank Ms McNeill for her question. Um, as I said in my first answer, uh, local authorities have a key role in planning for the housing needs of everyone within their community, uh, including uh, those that require housing that is wheelchair accessible. Uh, and I do think uh, that people should have the, the homes that suit their needs. Uh, work is underway to develop guidance for local authorities and other stakeholders on the need to set that realistic target uh, of delivery for wheelchair accessible housing across all tenures and not just social housing. And this will be incorporated into the revised local housing strategy guidance, which will be reviewed later on this year. 
At this moment, the latest available statistics show that 91% of the housing that we're delivering in our housing programme is housing for varying needs, and that is welcome. And I expect that standard to continue. Um, Presiding officer, I also met with housing conveners uh, at COSLA this morning uh, and reiterated what I've said previously uh, about subsidy levels uh, for wheelchair accessible housing, where we will be flexible. And beyond them, that, I've asked them to take account of their waiting lists to see exactly what housing is required to reach that realistic target that I think that we all want to see. Polly McNeill. Officer, I welcome that answer. But firstly, will the Minister acknowledge that people with disabilities who struggle to find suitable housing, it's not just a question of those in wheelchairs, and that there's a whole range of people, in fact, people with walking difficulties and breathing difficulties who need ground floor properties does need to be recognised. But does the Minister not believe that it's now time for a more specific strategy um, that ensures that, for example, the model that Glasgow has adopted, that where there's more than 20 units being built, that 10% of those units should be readily adaptable. Does the Minister think this might be a way forward, given he's made commitments to me in the past, that he will think seriously about concrete proposals to make sure that we are not in this position at the end of this Parliament? Minister. Uh, President officer, I don't want to be dictatorial to local authorities because each local authority has to assess its own needs uh, and during the course of the Christmas and New Year holiday period I spent a long time looking at council's strategic housing investment plans uh, and for example uh, Angus Council um, has worked out that its requirement in terms of specialist housing um, is 16% of uh, the houses that they are building so I don't want to be prescriptive in that but what I do want and as I said earlier, I reiterated again to housing conveners today, is for them to assess uh, well exactly what is required. In some cases, that's easier for councils who have uh, their own council housing because they can make assessments uh, from waiting lists about what's required. Um, but I would also expect councils uh, who, have, who do not have their own housing to cooperate with housing associations to see exactly what is required in their area. As I've said previously, um, the government will be flexible uh, around about subsidy uh, on these issues because I, like Ms McNeill, want to see more housing uh, for specialist need, whether that be wheelchair accessible or that housing for varying need, uh, as I stated earlier. Finally, presiding officer, um, could I say to members uh, and to people out there um, that we have a really good service in Scotland, Housing Options Scotland, who will help disabled and older people uh, with advice and advocacy uh, on their housing needs. And I would urge all members uh, to use that service if they deem it appropriate. Thank you to members and ministers. Apologies for those who couldn't get